This video is brought to you by MUBI. Get a whole month free at MUBI.com slash do cinema. Directors will oftentimes do anything it takes to achieve their creative vision, pushing themselves and their teams to the limits. But when a director gets a bit too much creative freedom or budget, sometimes things can get a little out of hand. In this video, we're going to take a look at times when directors went to the absolute extreme in order to create groundbreaking cinema. I made a tier list of the most extreme directors of all time, from Stanley Kubrick's insane perfectionism to Coppola's disastrous production of Apocalypse Now and Christopher Nolan capturing a nuclear explosion. Sit back and relax, because what you're about to witness is the literal peak of cinema. Also, if you want to get some epic merch from your favorite movies and directors, check out our web shop because we are fully stocked again. Now let's get into the video. Our first director on the list is none other than James Cameron. Why is he on there? Well, this man made 3 out of 5 highest grossing movies of all time. For the Titanic, he built a massive 800 foot replica of the ship in Mexico. And even crazier, he visited the real Titanic in a submarine not once, not twice, but a total of 12 times. And as if that wasn't extreme enough, he also broke the world record for diving solo to the deepest trench on planet Earth, which is 11,000 meters deep. James Cameron is known for developing really ambitious filmmaking techniques. For The Abyss, he filled a giant abandoned nuclear plant with 7 million gallons of water, which was the largest underwater movie set ever built. He then worked 15 years on Avatar and in the process designed the first handheld 3D camera so that they didn't have to use this unit. It's safe to say Cameron doesn't shy away from a challenge. So in my opinion, give this man all the budget he needs and simply let, let him go. Our next guest is Christopher Nolan. Where James Cameron is praised for his use of CGI and visual effects, Christopher Nolan will literally do anything but CGI. And when I say anything, I mean anything. He most famously crashed a real plane into a hangar for Tenet because apparently crashing a real Boeing 747 was cheaper than hiring a visual effects team. And besides, it's a lot more fun. He also flipped a giant truck for The Dark Knight, he dropped an airplane from the sky for The Dark Knight Rises, and for Interstellar he actually visited a black hole. <laughs> He did, however, create the first visualization ever of a black hole, by working with astronomers and physicists. In 2017, the first actual picture was taken of a black hole, which proved Nolan's visualization to be very accurate and ahead of its time. At this point, what can't this man do? Well, for his new movie Oppenheimer, a story about the inventor of the atomic bomb, Nolan recreated the first nuclear weapon detonation, the 1945 Trinity Test. But of course, this time with CGI, right? Right? With real explosives and without the use of CGI. No, this can't be. Does that mean he actually did it? Nolan, you gotta chill out bro. I dug a little bit more into this and it appears as though Nolan recorded in the actual desert where the Trinity test took place, which is in Los Alamos, New Mexico. To quote Nolan himself, it's one of the most challenging projects I've ever taken on in terms of the scale of it. There were big logistical challenges, big practical challenges. Hmm, I can imagine. In case you were wondering, the largest practical explosion in the history of cinema was for the James Bond movie Spectre. They used a total of 68 tons of TNT. In other words, that's 68,000 kilograms of TNT. But Nolan was like, Legalize nuclear bombs. Because the Trinity test was equal to 25 million kilograms of TNT. That's 367 times larger than this. Mother trucker, dude. To me, that's cinema. The real challenge with creating such an explosion is that there's usually only one chance to get it right. Unless you hide in a refrigerator, of course. The other option is to just use CGI, which is exactly what they did for the TV show Twin Peaks, and it looks great as well. But Nolan's response to using CGI was, if it's been created from no physical elements and you haven't shot anything, it's going to feel like animation. There aren't many behind the scenes pictures for Oppenheimer yet, but this is how an AI imagined it to look like. Pretty cool. Knowing Christopher Nolan's track record of practical effects, I'm willing to bet a phone call was made. Or at least, he entertained the idea. But until they reveal their exact method, it remains a mystery. However, it's likely a part of New Mexico, so a reasonably sized explosion. Wake up, filthy. With that being said, I think it's safe to say that Christopher Nolan is certified 
real. Call the fire department. We just nuked the building. Next up, we have Alfred Hitchcock, who is no stranger to pushing the envelope either. Because for his classic film The Birds, a story about a town being attacked by birds, Hitchcock had a nice little surprise for the actors. Because he didn't inform them that instead of using mechanical birds, he was gonna use real birds to attack them. Psych! For the scene up in the attic, bird trainers threw birds at the lead actress for five days straight in order to get the right takes. By Friday, they had me on the floor, you know, because I just crumpled from sheer exhaustion, and I was uh, under doctor's care for a week. This decision added an extra layer of terror and realism to the movie, and it certainly created a more authentic performance. She wasn't acting, she was reacting, <laughs> you know, those birds were being thrown at her. Even though this is already insane, our list is gonna get a lot crazier. Trust me. Because the director who also put the actors and himself through a living hell is Francis Ford Coppola. The production of Apocalypse Now is often cited as one of the most troubled and difficult productions in cinematic history. Coppola famously said, We were in the jungle. There were too many of us. We had access to too much money, too much equipment, and little by little, we went insane. From day one, things just went wrong. Lead actor Martin Sheen had a severe drinking problem and was kept drunk because Coppola thought that it would perfectly fit his character. Stop it. Get some help. Members of the cast and crew were throwing parties long into the night, taking all kinds of substances, and it became clear that the shoot wasn't gonna take a few weeks. But then, the real trouble started. First, a typhoon hit the island, destroying all the sets. On top of that, Martin Sheen suffered a heart attack. And then, Marlon Brando arrived on set completely unprepared and overweight, thinking he was gonna go on a nice holiday or something because he didn't read the book that the movie was based on. So they had to shoot all of his scenes in the dark to hide it. And as if things couldn't get any worse, a civil war broke out in the Philippines where they filmed everything. In the middle of a complicated shot, the helicopters were called away to fight the rebels. Wait a second, stand by. Uh, we just heard they're taking away five of our helicopters. Should we do it? But despite all the setbacks, they just kept on going. Coppola lost 100 pounds and the stress eventually caused an epileptic seizure. In the end, it took over 10 years to make the movie from idea to finish, but Apocalypse Now is regarded as a masterpiece and a testament to Coppola's determination. Which is why Coppola deserves to be up there on the third place and is officially certified a madman. In the best sense of the word, of course. Next up is Wes Anderson. We all know he is famous for his obsession with symmetry, which requires a high level of precision and OCD. That's why someone created this. Have a listen. What did I say? What did I say? Everything has to be symmetrical. If it's not gonna be symmetrical, it's not going in the movie. I'm Wes Anderson. Let's just pretend this actually happened. One example of Anderson's extreme filmmaking was during Fantastic Mr. Fox. Not only did he shoot stop motion animation using hundreds of miniature props and sets, which requires immense precision, he also had the actors record their dialogue outside of his studio to get a more natural reaction, which results in something like this. <laughs> Wes Anderson may not be the wildest director of them all, but he certainly goes to great lengths for his movies. And that's why he deserves to be on the list. Everything has to be symmetrical! Then we have a director who is often quoted for making the weirdest movie ever made. His name is Alejandro Jodorowsky. You rarely come across a director like this man, and the weird movie I'm talking about is called The Holy Mountain. Fun fact, it was actually a huge inspiration for Kanye West's Yeezus tour design. I made a full video about it if you're interested. Why is it the weirdest? Well, his movies are full of violence and occult symbolism, but behind them lies a sense of exploring the unknown, the boundaries of cinema, spirituality and religion. It is a director praised by cult cinema enthusiasts, and in his free time, Jodorowsky performs a thing called psychomagic to heal people. This is what that looks like. By the way, he is also the man who wanted to make a 14-hour adaptation of Doom, a masterpiece that never got made because he refused to make it shorter. Jodorowsky is a mysterious man, a true avant-garde artist, and his movies are certainly an unforgettable experience, which is why he deserves to be on the list as well. Now, another cult classic director is Quentin Tarantino. When he won the Palme d'Or for Pulp Fiction in 1994, people began yelling during a speech that the arthouse film by Kieslowski should have won. But Tarantino was like, you are watching a master at work. 
he did something totally different for his time. And as he is about to say, his films were not for everybody. I don't make the kind of movies that kind of bring people together. I kind of make movies that kind of split people apart. People were like, who does this guy think he is with his ultra-violent movies filled with feet shots and cuss words? And to be honest, I still question the feet shots, but all the other things are what makes him great. So yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing Tarantino's 10th and last movie, because you're watching A Master at Work. Our list is coming along nicely, but we have three more places to go. And the second last goes to Lars von Trier. I'll make this a quick one, because one day von Trier woke up and thought to himself, What am I doing with my life? He threw all filmmaking rules out of the window, got rid of all the nonsense in movies, and created a list of 10 rules for making a film. His movement was called Dogma 95, and the list was called The Vow of Chastity. And for those of you who don't know what that means, well... Yeah. A few of those rules were the director must not be credited, no lighting effects or filters, no superficial action, and basically do not make a Marvel movie. You might be asking yourselves, what are we left with? Well, the most boring movie you'll ever see. But let's not get into his other films. And because of his out-of-the-box approach, he deserves a spot on my list as well. Now, do you know what the highest rated movie on Letterboxd is? It's not Shawshank Redemption, not The Godfather, but the Russian movie Come and See by L.M. Klimov. It is regarded as one of the most realistic and important war movies ever made, and the story behind its production is quite terrifying. Because the events were so realistic, Alan Klimov, who fought during World War II at a young age, hired a therapist to hypnotize the 13-year-old main character, because he was afraid that these dreadful experiences would affect his young mind. Throughout the film, real bullets were used. As Klimov said in this interview, at times they flew just above the actors' heads, making their terrified looks genuine. In the end, the hypnotization didn't work on the young actor, so all the horrors he experienced could have easily affected his young mind. The experience of making this movie was so mentally and physically draining for Klimov that he never made another movie again. Вот, но надо в жизни иногда совершать какие-то настоящие поступки и деяния. Но после этого мне не захотелось просто следующее кино снимать. This is without a doubt a magnum opus, and if you haven't watched this movie, go watch it. Especially now, it's more relevant than ever. So Klimov definitely deserves the second place. So now, the moment we have all been waiting for, the number one spot is reserved for none other than the great Stanley Kubrick. Kubrick was known to be very difficult to work with, but his attention to detail was unmatched. The lengths he was willing to go to for that perfect shot quite literally led actors to going mad. It's well known that he made actress Shelley Duvall go through hell for The Shining because he did a measly 148 takes for the baseball bat scene and put her under extreme pressure throughout the shoot. Look at this. I pulled all my hair. I pulled hunks of hair out on the windowsill. And the back got cut. Major trim, though. Hunks of hair. Oh, look. Okay. Well, I don't sympathize with Shelly. Oh, come on. What do you mean, roll Two video? Seconds. We're killing ourselves out here, and you're going to be ready. I am, too. I'm standing right by the door. So we play mood music? No, I can't Yeah, but when you came out like... Kubrick was a man without compromise and simply did everything his way. His perfectionism was truly obsessive at times. No, I think no, that line lays, is right. Right. When he lays down. No, I think that line's in the right place. He acquired a specifically designed lens from NASA to film the candle scenes in Barry Lyndon. And he destroyed almost all the rare handcrafted props and sets for 2001 A Space Odyssey. Because he didn't want all that hard work to be easily exploited by some grifters looking for easy profits. There are a lot of conspiracy theories regarding Kubrick's films. Many believe that The Shining was Kubrick's confession that he staged the moon landing. And in his last movie ever, Eyes Wide Shut, it certainly looks like he's trying to expose the weird rituals of the elite culture. He showed a cut of the film on March 1st, 1999. Six days later, he passed away. Maybe Kubrick just knew too much. Who knows? But that is why I would put him as the most extreme director of all time. And I really respect him and really like him, both as a person and as a director. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed. He's taught me more than I've learned on all the other pictures I've done within one year's time on one picture. The dedication of all these directors and willingness to push the limits on and off screen has resulted in some of the greatest, if not the greatest, films of all time. This goes to show that oftentimes a grain of madness is the best of art. 
If you have more additions to the list, please write them down below. And if you want to watch more Masters at Work, definitely check out Stalker by Tarkovsky, Good Time by the Safdie Brothers, and Drive by Nicholas Reffen, which are all streaming on Movie right now. Movie is a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema, a place to discover ambitious new films and singular voices from iconic directors to emerging auteurs. And the best thing is that they are all carefully handpicked by movie curators, streaming anytime, anywhere. We work anytime, anywhere. We work Jewish holidays? Anytime, anywhere. You can try movie free for 30 days at movie.com slash do cinema. That's mubi.com slash do cinema for an entire month of great cinema for free. <laughs>